All right, welcome everyone, uh, and uh, thanks for coming uh, to this talk. Uh, uh, my name is Urs Hölzle, obviously. I'm uh, actually very happy to introduce uh, today's talk and, and, and to have helped in, in arranging it. Actually, Leslie, thank you for really uh, doing everything and for enabling us to have a special showing. Who, who has seen the movie? I assume pretty much everyone, all right. Um, um, and uh, so, so it's great to have uh, Jeff actually here uh, to talk about it. I wanted to say just a few things why I think it's kind of particularly um, uh, interesting for us as Google to, to host you today. And I, I think it's sort of two parts. One is that clearly for us, um, renewable energy has been a topic for a long time and energy use, et cetera, right? We're trying hard in, in, our, in our corporate operations and in our data center operations to uh, uh, save energy and, and power things with renewable energy, be that here with you know the, the solar panels on the roof or or in data centers where we've done wind deals and where we also worked really hard to to um, save literally a factor of two in terms of the amount of power required to run a, a certain workload. Um, so that's one kind of sort of obvious parallel, I think, over the uh, past few years. But then the other one, and then obviously as a company, we're, we're committed to being carbon neutral, have been since 2007. So so that clearly is a relevant sort of comparison. And the other thing, though, that struck me when I saw the movie was that I think it's really um, striking that, you know, climate change is something you can't really grasp, right? It's this abstract concept, right? And the movie does really an excellent job in sort of translating to that something that you can see, right? Translating something that, that really doesn't have an easy way for you to relate to it, right? And this is the first time that I've seen um, a, 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 you know, really compelling way of, of seeing what actually happens. And this morning, actually, I had an interview with, with two journalists, and they're, they're writing a story, and their story is about where the, interle uh, where the internet lives. And the internet actually has kind of the same property. Like, everyone uses it, like climate, right? Everyone's affected by it. But it's actually not very graspable, right? You see your laptop and it's connected to your internet, but like you actually don't see anything else, right? Maybe you see, uh, you know, a, a Wi-Fi router somewhere, right? And a cable coming out from it. But that's kind of, for most people, the end of the understanding really where the internet really lives, right? And, and, and so, you know, making that visible was actually last year the goal of our, of our uh, 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 where the internet lives uh, data center site, right? With the picture set center. We got a lot of response too, where people said, oh, finally, I can actually kind of understand visually what happens when, when, when I use uh, the internet. So lots of parallels. So let me briefly introduce uh, Jeff. I'm gonna go look at my uh, uh, notes. Um, uh, Jeff Orlowski, uh, I think most of you have, have seen the screening. Uh, if you haven't seen the screening, uh, it's still playing in, in a number of theaters. I saw it in, in Palo Alto before Christmas. Um, and uh, Jeff won the Excellence in Cinematography Award at the Sundance, uh, Sundance uh, Film Festival, you know, premier, obviously, festival for, for independent uh, movies. And if you've seen the movie, you know why, right? It really is just visually stunning and, 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 and at the same time moving in, in more than one uh, way. Uh, and so I'm very happy that he's here. His work obviously ha has helped uh, lots of people. I don't know, do you have a, a viewer account? Uh, like how many people have seen the, the movie already? We're working on that. I don't okay. have an explicit account. So my, my guess would be at least hundreds of thousands of people already yeah, see it. Uh, the trailer on YouTube is, is actually very popular. It's a four minute trailer uh, on, on YouTube. So I'm very pleased here to have uh, uh, Jeff Orlowski and uh, pleased to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks for having, am I, we're using the love, right? Not this one? Um, uh, thank you guys very much for being here. Uh, I went to Stanford, I spent a bunch of time here during undergrad and it's just really cool to be back on campus and on campus, this isn't my campus, but. Um, uh, but yeah, we, we're just thrilled to have the opportunity to share the film with you guys um, and that you had a chance to see the film yesterday. Um, it's something where we went into this without really knowing what we were going to do. Um, we didn't go into it with the intention of making a film, in fact. Um, when I first met James, um, the goal was really just to document him uh, and to document his project. But uh, I'll kind of get into that with some images in a little bit. Um, I, I've got a bunch of photographs here that I wanted to show uh, and kind of keep it free form, and then we'll kind of jump into Q&As pretty quickly. So uh, I want to try and address any kind of questions you guys have as, as soon as possible. But um, if you haven't had a chance to see the film, 
this is the whole film right here. Um, that's the Final Cut timeline. That's not all of the audio tracks, in fact. I think we ended up getting into like the 20s or 30s in terms of the number of audio tracks. Um, and it's, I, I just took a screen grab of this one day and I showed it to some friends and then realized, you know, this is the complexity that goes into the editing process. And the more impressive thing in my mind, just conceptually, is that each one of those lines, each one of those slices is another creative decision that you have to make. And the process of editing a film, it is in part very technical, but at the same time it's, it's artistic and you have to make all these decisions on the fly. And there's an, literally an infinite number of ways you can edit a film. Uh, we spent three years editing Chasing Ice. Um, there's some reasons and some stories as to why it took that long and some of the concepts that we were shifting uh, as we went through the development of the film. But um, we can save that for, for later if you want. Um, I'm going to show the trailer real fast just in case anybody hasn't seen it. It's a, it's a short two minute little trailer for the film. I'm on the phone with Jim on one of our regular check-ins. Jim, nothing's happening. It's starting, Adam. I think Adam is starting. Right? Look at that. Look at the whole thing. It all started in Iceland. I think I'm so certain to get wet, I'll take my boots off. I never imagined that you could see glaciers this big disappearing in such a short time. There's a powerful piece of history that's unfolding in these pictures, and I have to go back. The initial goal was to put out 25 cameras for three years, shoot every hour as long as it was daylight, that would show you how the landscape was changing. Oh, this is the way to travel, my friend. Putting really delicate electronics in the harshest conditions on the planet. It's not the nicest environment for technology. I do not want to go any lower than this. It's just bottomless. I'm going out here on this broken fin, and I assume it won't collapse. Every once in a while, you get the same. What were you thinking? <laughs> Maybe that office job wasn't so bad. This thing is loose. Rock, it's not working. God, all of that obsession means nothing if it doesn't work. Just be careful. Don't get too close to the edge, all right? This is terrifying. This knee has had two surgeries, and it really could use a third. He goes to that point where he can't anymore, and sometimes he's going further. We have low oil pressure engine number two. This is big stuff happening right now. OK, onward. This is the memory of the landscape. That landscape is gone. It may never be seen again in the history of civilization, and it's stored right here. Um, so, uh... I just saw the reference to the, the original song uh, that we had scored. Uh, the film has just been nominated for an Academy Award um, in the category of Best Original Song. Uh, we're actually trying to get Scarlett Johansson, who performed the song, trying to get her to do a live performance at the Academy Awards, um, which would be really awesome if we can pull that off. But uh, we're trying to figure that out. Um, so uh, as Urs was saying earlier, um, what James was really trying to do was to create a visualization of climate change. You know, from his perspective, he's a photographer, he was out in the field, he saw this, uh, these landscapes changing and he wanted to figure out how could he as a photographer use his skills and tools to make this happen. Um, and in the process, uh, even you can kind of get a sense of it for the feel, the feel that we were going for with the trailer, uh, we didn't want this to be a very science heavy film about climate change. In fact, at the beginning, we didn't want it to be about climate change at all. We were really considering it a film about a photographer. We called it The Photographer. It was about James's entire life's work uh, and uh, a lot of different photographic projects that he had done over his whole career. And we were using the story of the ice as a through line, effectively. And uh, in the editing process, we realized that um, we, we needed to shift that, and we wanted to switch that around um, to make it much more focused on the extreme ice survey and what James accomplished with these time lapses. But it brings, the, uh, brings up the issue of how do you communicate climate change to the public? And this is something that we spent a lot of time thinking about. Because we didn't want to approach it as though, here's a science heavy film you're going to sit and be lectured to and listen to experts, you know, talking heads about the issue. We really tried to frame it in terms of the adventure um, and the experience that we had. 
Now, when we first set off, that, um, that wasn't really the goal at all. Like I said, we weren't planning on making a film. James wanted to uh, set up these time-lapse cameras, put them out there, and just document what was going on. And I met James when I was a, a junior at Stanford. Uh, the project was getting started when I was a senior, and I had the fortune of joining him and going out into the field with him. And my role was just to shoot video. Um, that was the intention at the beginning. Um, so some, uh, somebody else shot this time lapse. This is a time lapse of the camera being built. So a time lapse of the time lapse. Um, but uh, it was, you know, this is something that was founded in his garage. He had random, you know, parts from the hardware store that he put together, and he built something that he thought could be installed and uh, would hopefully last for a long period of time. And uh, the first trip that we did to Iceland, it was in March of 2007. Uh, it was the team of these six guys. Um, and we had the cameras that James had designed out in the field. And we got to Iceland. We had these tripods. We were going to mount them to the ground. We were going to secure them with uh, guy wires. And when we got there, we realized the ground was way too soft. The cameras wouldn't be, like they wouldn't say sturdy. So we had to go to lumber, like we were going to hardware stores trying to find lumber so that we could build a, a bracket that could be mounted to the wall. And you couldn't find pressure treated lumber in Iceland. And then everything was metric units and all of our tools didn't work. And like, it was just uh, all these seemingly small, easy, little minuscule details were really putting the whole project into jeopardy from the very, very first installation uh, in Iceland. And ultimately, we found enough parts at the hardware store. We were able to like, you know, jerry-rig a system, and we installed the cameras. And those rigs have been out there now with a bunch of problems and rock falls and you know, interruptions in the, in the process. But they've been out there now for just about six years. Uh, in two more months, it'll have been six years of photography that we've captured. Um, but you know, this is, uh, I had very short hair back then. Um, back in March of 2007, the goal from my perspective was just to follow James and to document what he was doing. The video was intended for YouTube videos, for promotional materials, for him to help get funds raised um, by showing people what he was doing. And we weren't planning on making a film. Uh, but for me, it was just, you know, being 23 years old and having the opportunity to go to Greenland and then having the chance to go to Iceland and get to shoot and explore these landscapes. That's what got me hooked on it, and that's why I wanted to work with him in the first place. And uh, it wasn't until about a year and a half into the project where James had been doing a lot of lectures. He had been showing the time lapses at that point, and we were seeing the response from audiences. Um, between the response from the audience of the power of the time lapse photography, combined with you know, over 100 hours of video footage that we had collected at that point, we knew that we had the materials to go ahead and start making a film. So that's when I really started pushing James heavily. Give me the green light. Let me make the film. Uh, he, finally, he, he didn't want to be the subject of the film. You know, he's a guy who's normally behind the camera, and he's the one who wants to take pictures of other things. So the whole time, he was always reluctant to be in front of the camera. Um, it was uncomfortable for him. Uh, he got used to it over time. He got comfortable with you know, just when the camera's there or that often and always filming him. You kind of have to get used to it. Um, so that, that was the upside. But uh, finally, he recognized the potential and the value for a film, uh, gave me the green light, and we started building a team, and we started going ahead and editing it. But uh, I just want to show a bunch of other images out in the field, some of the stuff that's not in the film, uh, and try and give you some, some anecdotes behind some of the, the key events that happened. Um, but one of the most amazing things for me was uh, going ice climbing for the first time. Uh, I had done a lot of outdoor stuff. I had done a lot of camping and, and done a lot of rock climbing, but never ice climbing. So you're wearing crampons, these huge spike things that you know, have, will secure you on the ice. Um, and you're using these ice axes and climbing around. And this one flank right here, that's the very first piece of ice I ever climbed. Um, and it was a, an incredible, like, it was so much fun. I was so thrilled just by having this completely new experience of your hands and your feet attaching to a wall in a different way. And uh, a couple months after we were in this landscape taking these photographs, we got the update from the time-lapse camera. And uh, this landscape here, all of the dark ice, the black ice here, with all the dirt on it, it's called dead ice. And the, the white uh, behind it is the actual main glacier that's flowing. So if you imagine you know, the glacier's flowing, it's going next to the, the mountainside. Um, and what happens, a lot of the darkness is debris from the glacier kind of scraping the mountain and it falling onto the ice. But then sometimes there, there are these little eddies that are frozen in place, and they're not flowing with the regular glacier. So they call that dead ice. And it's, it's old. It's pretty stable. And all of this in the foreground was that dead ice. 
And a couple months after this, we got the images from the time-lapse camera, and all of this had disappeared. I mean, this entire landscape that we had spent days and days climbing on, exploring, you know, that, those like first experiences ice climbing, it was, it was all gone. And the realization that these landscapes are changing that fast in such a big fashion, uh, that was a huge revelation for me. Uh, so the cameras are out there, um, and we look at them as our little, you know, sentinels, our little R2-D2s, shooting every, now they're shooting every half hour of daylight. So, you know, it's uh, 18 minutes ago, we had 34 cameras around the world turn their sensor on, check to see if there's enough light. Um, the timers that we designed, uh, that we redesigned in the process of, of working on, on improving the technology, uh, the timer has a light sensor in it. And that's allowing the system to save a lot of power in the, the long, cold winters that have no daylight. So it checks to see if there's enough light. We'll turn the camera system on. It'll take one exposure. It'll wait 30 seconds and put the whole thing into hibernation and wait for the next half hour to take the next photograph. Um, Originally, the camera boxes were all gray because we were concerned about vandalism. We were concerned that in Iceland, there are places where you know, people can come, they might steal the cameras. There's a warning on the, on the back of the camera box. Um, and we installed a bunch of these gray cameras. And then we got to certain places, and we couldn't find them when we were looking for them. We were like flying around in the helicopter trying to find the camera. So ultimately, we switched to these orange camera boxes for the very remote ones, which made a big difference in spotting them in these landscapes. Um, but this here is a, a, another shot from that Columbia Glacier. Um, and this here, the, the dead ice that I was referencing is in this foreground. This glacier has now retreated all the way back to that mountain ridge, and it's split into two separate glaciers. So now there are two different branches to the Columbia Glacier. Um, and that's all documented from that camera right there. This camera has had to, uh, it's been panned. In the film, it's the one that was panned a couple of times. And this one has also been moved as well to a location to continue the, the record. This next shot is from an iceberg that calves off the Columbia Glacier. So that's, a, that's the same kind of island in the back. And um, this here, it's, uh, this was even shot in the summertime, but it's so backed up with ice that although this is the surface of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, sorry, the Pacific Ocean, um, it's, it's filled with icebergs all the way back. So that is the surface of the Pacific Ocean, all those icebergs that are, that are kind of stuck in there. And, um, this was one of the stupider things that we did, one of the riskier things. But because these, these pieces of ice do roll over and they'll break and roll at any given time. Um, so we had a helicopter, we flew around, we put Adam on the piece of ice. He had a walkie-talkie. If he wanted to bail at any moment, he could have just called us and said, I'm done. Um, and we tried to keep it really, really quick. We did a couple of passes um, filming Adam on the, on the piece of ice and, uh, and photographing it as well. Um, and the reason why he's there is for scale. Um, and it's something that we talked about in the film, and it's something that's really, really difficult to communicate in these landscapes because they are far larger than anything you, know, you can possibly experience in the lower 48. Um, I've been to Glacier National Park. We installed cameras there. It, it doesn't compare whatsoever um, to Glacier National Park. These landscapes are, are huge. And the only way you can get a sense of how big they are is through some scale reference. So we would regularly try to put people in, um, you know, boats or helicopters or any sort of human reference that gives you a sense of it. Um, on the Greenland ice sheet, uh, which we filmed for quite a bit. That's the, it's in the middle of the film where it's the landscape of literally just ice in all directions. That's all you see. There's no wildlife. There are no, there's no plants whatsoever. There's algae, which is the only other living matter whatsoever. Um, and then all you hear is the sound of wind and the sound of water as it's running across the surface of the Greenland ice sheet. Um, the only way you can get there is uh, by helicopter. We did spend quite a bit of time in the helicopter um, to get to these locations because that's the only way you can get there. And when that helicopter takes off and you're there with your pile of gear and you hear the choppers fading off in the distance, it's a very, very lonely feeling. Um, you, you have the full, deep appreciation for the fact that you've got a limited set of resources, you've got limited supplies, it's you and three other people, and your survival is based on you guys being able to work together, trust each other, you know, make sure your food and your fuel and everything lasts for the time that you need it to. Um, We've been out on the Greenland ice sheet and at other places in Greenland where um, we get stuck there due to bad weather. Um, even times when the weather is crystal clear, blue skies just like this, they call us from the airport and say, it's foggy here, we can't take off. 
And there were times where I almost missed my graduation because we were delayed a day uh, of helicopter flights. James was stuck in, uh, in Greenland for five days one time because they couldn't get the helicopter to him. The way they do their scheduling there, if you miss your time slot, they put you at the end of the list. So they do all the, re the other reservations, and then they come and get you at the next available slot. Not really ideal, but um, <laughs> certainly when you're like down to your last couple packets of food, but uh, it, it always worked out um, in the end. But th they do give you access to incredible places that you would not be able to see anywhere else. And once again, imagine what this place, wh what it would look like without Adam standing there without that scale reference. Um, I actually was just thinking of photoshopping him out just to show the picture first and just imagining what it looks like. And then when you see the human scale, it really changes things. Uh, the black stuff at the bottom, if you remember from the film, it's, uh, it's that stuff called cryokinite. So that is uh, soot, it's black carbon, it's a lot of other dust and pollutants, um, along with meteorite dust and some dust from uh, kind of Asia that gets blown in. Um, and that's causing the ice to melt faster, but it also creates these really, really beautiful um, landscapes and features. This is where we shot in that Mulan uh, in the film, and uh, this was one of the days where we were scouting it. Um, it. The photo looks rather treacherous, and like it, I could just slide right off, but I felt secure at the time, I, I recall. <laughs> um, you can just barely make out on the right-hand side at the top a couple little dots uh, little black dots. So those are people standing up there who were setting up anchors. Uh, we had gone to that side, we hiked around uh, and came to this side of the Mulan and we assessed from this side as well and we decided we were going to shoot from there for better lighting conditions and the way the light would come in through this, uh, through the um, canyon. We set the anchors up uh, on the first day. We set all the anchors up in triplicate. So you see a bit of that in the film where uh, there's a drill that goes in uh, and two different drill holes are made and they're connected and it's, it's called a V-thread. And if you go ice climbing, typically you would do that with a six inch or an eight inch deep uh, ice screw and you would make a connection like that. Um, but out of, uh, in respect for James's paranoia, uh, we used these one meter long drills and we had them in triplicate. So that those columns of ice could haul a lot of weight. You could pull a car up with those anchors. So one person was tied into those three separate anchors on one rope. Um, and then you have a second rope going to a belayer who's also tied into another set of three anchors. And when, whenever people went down, certainly over the hole itself, they had two ropes. In some other cases, w because we only had four people, if three of us were down at the same time, we, we took some other precautions. But when you're there with only one rope, it is significantly dangerous. You swing your ice axe the wrong way and you hit that rope, you're in some pretty deep trouble. Um, so it's, it's, you have to be very, very careful and conscious when you're climbing on ice, how you're using the tools, where you're walking. You can't just step around and walk normally because if your crampon steps on the rope, that rope is, is damaged. It's very, very vulnerable. Um, so you have to be paranoid about those things. Um, James has lost a lot of friends out in the wilderness due to light aircraft accidents and also climbing accidents where people, you know, they're walking and their crampon hits their, the inside of their pant leg and they trip and fall and you go off a cliff. Um, it's also very easy to get confused, not, not get confused, but be, have, have a false sense of security from the camera. Um, because you're shooting and you're like, oh, I can go up to the edge here, this is safe, and actually wait, I need to be a little bit closer. And there was one time I was standing on this um, ice bridge and there was another piece of ice right in front of me and I thought it was pinned on the beach and I thought I could step on it securely and so I, I've got the camera in my hand and I shift my weight over and I'm, I'm shifting and once I committed my weight, I felt the ice start to sink underneath my foot. And I'm holding the camera and I've got these huge rain slickers on and it's totally bulky and I can't move effectively and I start feeling myself sinking into the water. I slide off the, the ice bridge and completely going up to my neck in ice water. I took the camera, I like turned, I saved the camera, I put it on <laughs> where I was standing. That was like the top priority. Um, and then I like struggled and climbed out and at, that was one of the first trips to Alaska. What I didn't even know or didn't even realize at the time um, that was, that was actually the scene where James, he's holding up the memory card and he's like, that, the memory of the landscape is, is stored right here. It may be gone forever, but it's stored here. Um, I shot that while I had these cotton base layers on, which I didn't even know at the time you shouldn't be wearing cotton or whatever. Um, I was freezing the whole day shivering. And when we got back to the, uh, the little motel we were staying at, I was peeling these layers off. James saw me take off like a regular pair of jeans and a cotton t-shirt and he started like yelling at me like, what are you doing wearing this stuff? You need to wear fleece or wool. 
Um, so you learn those lessons quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, just con I mean, the, I was surprised by how effective the rain slickers were at keeping heat in. They were very, very heavy, um, and they're waterproof, and they're very insulated. So it did a surprisingly good job of, of keeping that in. Um, but uh, separate from that, uh, we were just running around the whole time. And then I filmed him for a little bit. We were hiking around. We got back into the canoes pretty soon, and we were paddling back. And once we got in the car, it was like, blast the heater. Um, so all of that was fine. But anyway, so we, we spent a lot of time in this landscape making sure that everything was safe and secure. And we went down there the first day of shooting, and James got his photographs. I got my video. Um, and I, got, I had some problems with the video. I, I had set the camera to autofocus um, because I wasn't sure what the camera would see looking down into that hole. And so I set it like that. We got back to the tent that night, and we were reviewing the photographs, and James didn't like his stuff. And I looked at my photos in the video, and I saw that the camera had focused on the water droplets on the lens, that the waterfall had put all this mist and moisture on the lens, and I had really beautiful photographs of these water droplets, <laughs> and everything beyond was just blurry, out of focus, completely out of focus. So James said that he wanted to go back the next day because he wasn't happy with his photos. I was perfectly fine with that. I wanted to get some more video myself. So we ended up spending three days shooting down there. Um, this is a photo that I took of James uh, when he went down there as well. Um, and ultimately, you guys remember some of the footage that was from this scene. Uh, it's one of my favorite scenes in the film. And it's really, it, it's, uh, it's, all the credit has to go to James for figuring this out. But it's a place where you can very visually tell the story of climate change, where you can take the concept of how this ice is melting and how it's being transferred to the ocean. This is one of those key places where it's happening. This is how it's happening. And he was able to make a photograph. And in, in the same process, the adventure was compelling enough that it, it's been a very strong scene in the film. Um, another big scene was the, the big glacier calving, um, where this here is from the Alulasac Glacier, where an Adam and I spent, uh, we were planning to spend about a month, three to four weeks camped out there. Um, and on day 17 is when the calving actually happened. Um, this is another location, but just showing some more of the cameras. Um, the two of us maintained a 24-hour vigil. So we had three eight-hour shifts, and we would be up together for eight hours. And then I would have the night shift up until like five or six, and I, f I forget, like the wee or early hours in the morning. And then Adam had the morning shift, and then we were up for dinner again uh, every day. Uh, in the summertime, in May in Greenland, you have 24 hours of daylight. So if there was a big calving event that happened at 2 AM, we wanted somebody awake to capture it. Um, because of the distance to the glacier, we were about two miles away from the glacier, you don't necessarily hear when something starts to happen all the time. Um, that's typically the first indicator. Um, when you do hear a large pop or noise or rumble, and that's when you would stick your head out of the tent and, and start checking on things. But many times we've discovered we would be at a glacier, we'd have a time-lapse camera set up, we'd spend the whole day working, we would think that nothing happened to the glacier, we'd review the time-lapse fo footage and see that a bunch of pieces broke off and the glacier had advanced a whole lot and we didn't recognize it, we didn't, we didn't see it happen with our own eyes. And even on that short period of time, it's amazing to see how the cameras can capture something that you can't experience yourself. Um, and so we, we really tried to uh, keep a, a very ongoing vigil going. Uh, in the middle of the night, I was definitely in the tent more often than not. Um, it was still very, very cold. Um, this is one of the, the tents that we used for all of our gear. We had a kind of communal tent, uh, and then each of us had a tent. And then this was the gear tent with um, the orange cable is a long extension cord coming from our little 1,000-watt generator, which powered the computers, the whole rat's nest of chargers for all the cameras, um, all the hard drives. This case here carried four uh, uh, four terabytes worth of data in eight 500 gigabyte powered hard drives. We couldn't afford to get a whole bunch of small portable um, bus powered drives at the time, so they were all wall powered units. It was a suitcase that was very, very carefully padded and protected. It was like, this is the thing that we're guarding with our lives. Um, and it was a very heavy case with all those hard drives. Uh, but this is basically all the sensitive gear in this, uh, in this tent always having backups of every single piece of electronic gear, um, spare cameras. We had nine cameras on this particular trip, uh, four video and five time-lapse cameras, um, my computer and Adam's computer. And um, just the level of redundancy was really, really important for, uh, for this trip. 
Um, I think we're just about at time. Uh, there's not much more. The film is, has been really well received at a lot of different festivals. Um, it's been getting out there. We've won about 30 awards right now. Uh, as I mentioned, the Academy Award nomination uh, as well. Um, we have launched an iOS app that came out uh, about a couple weeks ago, maybe two months ago. Um, and so that has a, we're going to be putting a lot more uh, photos and video and content on there, trying to keep that updated and figuring out a lot more ways just to keep the imagery going and keep it, uh, keep it alive online. Um, really, the time lapses are continuing to shoot. And as James ups the updates the time lapses, we want to make those available to the public so they can see them and interact with them. And in the iOS app, you can like scrub your finger back and forth and see the glacier move forward and backward in time. Um, so I just wanted to close with a couple other photos. Um, this year we call it Kissing Bergs, uh, and this is from uh, a location in Greenland by the Alulasat Glacier. And those are some very, very massive pieces of ice. It's one of my favorite shots from the collection. Um, and this shot here is from a beach in Iceland. Um, and it's, it's interesting because James fell in love with this landscape. Um, there are these black, uh, just black sand beaches. And when you're walking around and you see these crystal you know, pieces of ice sitting on the beach, it looks like a diamond on the beach. Um, and he did a whole series of photographs that he calls ice diamonds. And it's about these, uh, we would shoot at night, he would backlight them, they would just be glowing, um, really, really spectacularly lit pieces of ice. In one of the time lapses, there's the nighttime scene in the film, there's the first shot where you see this, I call it Spaceberg, it's this glowing um, piece of ice. And uh, James actually used that technique of lighting it from behind to get that effect. And we use that in some of the night time lapses as well. Um, but it really was uh, discovered on this beach where he calls it the place where the ice goes to die. It's part of that cycle. It's part of that kind of mortality theme that he was kind of reflective about. And uh, it's something that always uh, left a strong impression on me, seeing these pieces of ice melting away. Um, that's, that's it in terms of what I wanted to share with you guys. Um, and I'd love to you know, answer any questions that you might have. Um, we do have wireless mics to record all of it. So thank you guys very much. Hello. Hi. Um, so going back to the main calving event, um, I know you said that you were about two miles away. How did it feel like it was getting closer once the ice started to turn over? And then my other question is, was there a plan B if nothing had happened within the month that you were planning? Um, yes, we had. Uh, the plan B was that we wouldn't have gotten anything, really. Um, and we were wanting to wait for as long as we possibly could. Uh, but you can't predict those things. Um, it, it was a trip where Adam and I went, we donated our time to go out there, and it was a $40,000 trip to send two guys to the middle of nowhere Greenland and to keep us alive for you know, a month. Um, so the, the expenses were really, really high. There was no real other real option. Uh, we were a bit strategic in that we went to a different glacier first, and then we went to the Lulusac Glacier. And so we're really trying to, um, to figure out between these two glaciers, optimizing the opportunity to capture something. At the Storr Glacier, we did capture a small calving event um, that we thought was valuable. If nothing else happened, that was a pretty decent one. But we still wanted to go to the bigger glacier, the Alulasat Glacier, um, with the hopes of capturing something much larger. And quite honestly, it was just serendipity, and the timing was worked out well. We had the knowledge of a, an entire year's worth of photography prior to that. So we knew what happened to the glacier in the year earlier. Um, and typically, the scientists are aware that there are spring breakups. So typically, in the May period of time is when the glacier would have calving events. You know, everything is kind of thawing out from the spring. Excuse me. Um, things are thawing out. Uh, that's when the glacier is starting to pick up some, some speed again. That bay, in particular, starts clearing out around that time. So we were really trying to aim around spending that time in May to capture it. It still was far bigger than anything we expected to capture. Um, your other question again? Uh, you were two miles away, but oh, distance. Um, so we were on solid bedrock. We were uh, very, very safe where we were. Um, there was no risk of the glacier affecting us at that location. Um, it would actually take about a half hour to hike from where we were standing to where the glacier was, where the dead ice begins, where we, were, where we would even be at any risk whatsoever. Um, and part of that was so that we could get a better vantage. 
we wanted to be in a spot where we could look down at the glacier to get a better perspective on it. And we zoomed the camera lenses in all the way we could to capture it, um, but that's, that's how we were able to capture it. Um, that said, the dead ice next to that glacier is another place where we spent a lot of time. We had cameras mounted there up until the day prior to the calving event, trying to capture things on a smaller scale. And it was interesting because from those time lapses, you could see the glacier flowing in the background, but the ice in the foreground was stagnant. And you can see kind of the relationship of those two different sections of ice. Um, but we were, we were very safe. Uh, I'll just add one other comment about that in regards to the sound. A lot of people ask questions about the sound for the calving. Um, because we were so far away, the actual audio that we captured on our cameras was very poor. Um, there's a lot of wind noise, there's a lot of distance, there's also a lot of us yelling and screaming and being like <laughs> ridiculously excited that, you know, finally something was happening. Um, and that's it. Uh, the way it's cut in the film is exactly how it happened. We were on the phone with James, we were doing a regular check-in, just giving him an update. And during the phone call is when the glacier started to move. We called him back three or four times during the, the span of the calving event, just giving him an update. It's, it's been 20 minutes, it's still happening. You won't believe it, it's huge. 40 minutes, it's still happening. Um, so we called him a bunch of times to give him the updates. And we could definitely feel that James was upset that he wasn't there watching it himself. <laughs> He's like back in the office in Boulder, like, why am I here? Um, but uh, the, the audio came from three main sources. Uh, we used audio that we had captured from other calving events where we were a lot closer. So typically in Alaska and then also in other places in Greenland where we were much closer to the glacier and got very good sound from the calving. Um, the second main source is from Skywalker in that they have an incredible library of ice calving sounds. Skywalker sound, uh, that's why they're the best in the world. Um, they've done a bunch of projects uh, where Ben Bird has gone out to Alaska to film ice calving and they had a great library for that. And the third thing was kind of interesting. Uh, some of the scientists that we work with, they use this device called a seismometer, which anybody in California is aware of. Uh, that's what's used to measure earthquakes. So they mount it to the bedrock and the device can pick up any vibration on the planet and it will pick up, uh, they call them ice quakes, when the glacier lurches forward or when a calving event happens, the, uh, the scientists can tell how violent the, the shaking was, the rumbling was, and they can take that information and those waves and they can convert it into sound. And you can actually hear the sound of the planet shaking when the ice is calving. And we had the event from that exact event, uh, the sound from that exact event, and we worked that into the film as well to, to mix it into there. Did you feel any rumbling? Um, at that distance, we didn't feel any distinct rumbling. Um, I, c I can't recall. I don't think Adam would say that he did either. Um, in part because of the noise and the, the wind and everything else, um, and just the, the distraction of, are the cameras running? Make sure, all right, batteries and memory cards, and hold on, we have to swap a tape. And you're so distracted with all of that that we didn't have that much opportunity to really just, you know, I think we both tried to milk those real experiences of like, Holy crap, look at what's happening, and we're, we're the only two people here. But it was also actively working hard. Um, this is such an enormous project, both in topic and in terms of uh, all the hours that were mm -hmm. probably filmed, thousands of hours. How do you even take something so enormous and begin editing it, begin like making, you know, having yeah. it all tie in together? It, it seems so intimidating to me to think about it, but how, how did you approach it? Um, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I think it's something that both James and I experienced many times over the course of the project and a number of times where we both felt like, okay, it's time to give up or should we give up or why are we doing this to ourselves? Um, it was one of those scenarios where to some degree ignorance is bliss. Um, and had I known how difficult it would have been at the beginning, I don't, <laughs> I'd like to think that I would have wanted to still do it, but um, <laughs> It was so, so hard. Uh, I think from James's perspective, the biggest struggle for him was the technology not working and the constant struggle for funding and keeping the whole thing alive. Um, it was incredibly difficult for him to fund the project. Um, it was hard for us to fund the film as well. It was all friends and family who f paid for the film um, and a lot of donated time that kept it going. But uh, it was really one of those things where uh, we felt the responsibility to get it out there. We knew that we needed to get it out there and we just had to figure out how could we get to that goal. Um, the beginning processes for the editing was very difficult and I worked with a writer who helped give me a structure to work with um, and he and I were talking through what we wanted from a big picture perspective and we decided here's a scene or we're going to cut this one scene 
and we tried it. And then we cut another scene. OK, that was good. And probably those, the first half dozen scenes that we cut aren't in the film at all anymore. Um, it had gone through so many iterations. But it was really trying to tackle it scene by scene, um, trying to keep one specific goal in mind that's tangible that you can accomplish. Um, this is what we want to do today. It's just this one thing. And really, the, all those million steps add up. Yes? Uh, do, we, do we need the microphone? or? Uh, we have the microphone over there. We'll, we'll get the mic down here. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I just wanted to hear about um, the film is so powerful. As you've been showing it to political leaders, what type of response you've been getting. Um, yeah. And, and a small uh, just technical question on how you decided on the interval of, uh, for the lapse. Yeah. So the, the intervals were based on uh, how many could we possibly milk out before the memory cards ran out of space. Um, given, OK, are we going to get back to this camera in a year? Or are we going to get back here in two years? Um, using 32 gigabyte cards with you know, calculating how many photos it would take, uh, we started off doing one every hour. And that was kind of the rubric. As the memory cards got larger and larger in capacity, um, as the system became more reliable, we upped that to every half hour. Um, if we were there with the cameras, where you know, when Adam and I are, are shooting or you know, the whole team is shooting something, we would set the cameras to shoot very, very quickly. Um, you know, in some cases, every five minutes watching the glacier. Or if we were doing kind of more aesthetic time lapses of ice moving, you know, they would be sometimes every second, every two seconds, every 10 seconds. So the interval was really dependent on what we were trying to capture. Um, and we broke them, conceptually, we broke them up into the long-term time lapses and short-term time lapses. That's the language that we always used. Um, because most people think of time lapses as a, a one-hour time lapse or a one-day-long time lapse. Um, and we would do those, but th that wasn't the core project. So for us, those were all short-term time lapses. Um, and then the, the political response to the film has been interesting. Uh, we did a screening before Congress, um, which doesn't mean that all of Congress came to see the film. Um, but we did, we did give out DVDs to every senator and every congressman in Washington. Um, so we feel like we upheld some sense of responsibility with that. Um, we've had a very good response from our senators and congressmen in Colorado that we're connected to and have seen the film and have been trying to support getting the film out there. Um, one of the issues is that it is such a political subject. Right now, everybody who comes in, from my perspective as a filmmaker, you know, making a documentary about this subject is particularly challenging. You can choose a subject where uh, people don't know anything about the issue, and they come in to see the film and they learn about your issue, and you can, can you know convey whatever you want, and they they leave the film learning more about that subject. Um, here, everybody comes into the film with the preconceived notion of climate change, whether it's happening or whether it isn't, their stance on the policy issues, what we should be doing about it. So we have this huge, huge uh, uphill battle to win an audience over and to get them to even kind of think about what we could do next. Um, we didn't want the film to be political. Um, we really tried to keep that out of the content of the film. There are some news clips that are in the film that are really just establishing this is where we are socially, culturally. This is where the conversation about this issue is happening. Um, there is still this childlike debate among some media outlets as to whether or not it is or isn't happening. Um, and we, we needed that in the film because that's the only reason why James did the project in the first place. You know, if it wasn't for that lack of consensus in the public's eye, not from the scientific perspective, but from the public's eye, James would have had no reason to make the time lapses in the first place. So um, it, it's been interesting to see what kind of influence the film can have in the political space. Um, there are more and more groups that are trying to leverage the film uh, to advance awareness about the issue. Um, we want the film to be used as a tool for that purpose. I mean, that's kind of our mindset now. Uh, like I said, that wasn't the intention when we made the film. We wanted it to be James's story. This is his experience. This is what he saw. This is what his cameras captured. You can't argue with the photography. Like, this is what's going on. And you can make your own assessment as to you know, what this means from the long-term perspective. You know, James's opinion is, is stated in the film in, in regards to that. But it's something where we really wanted to give people, uh, we want the film to be used as a tool to get the awareness out there about the issue. And, um, we did a screening before the United Nations as well. Um, we haven't done a screening for Fox News. Um, we, we've done, uh, we did an interview with Fox News. Um, it was uh, expected but disappointing that all of the questions that they asked were just about our experience, about the project, about the aesthetics and the photography and the adventure. Um, and they didn't ask any questions about policy or you know, what needs to be done or why is there a debate about this issue. Um, 
So yeah. Yeah. Um, did you all hear the question? Or uh, it w the question was about um, when we were out there. How did we survive psychologically with the limited resources? Um, it, it was surprisingly easy from my perspective, and I think most of the team would agree, because we, were, we had a, such a specific mission uh, all the time. You know, we weren't just, well, okay, there, there are a couple different trips, and I guess different ones fit different categories. The glacier watching trip was unique. That was the only time where we were out there, and it was just me and Adam waiting for that period of time. All of the other trips, you know, we were with James. James had a specific photograph that he, wa that he had conceptual, uh, conceptual idea over, and every day was about trying to capture that one image. So we were very occupied with the work of the photography. Um, and even w that long glacier watching trip, um, we did bring a very big stack of books, um, definitely. Uh, we actually had to agree on which books we would bring because we had limited weight capacity that we could bring. So Adam and I, had, uh, we both had to sign off on every book that we took out there. Um, but uh, you're so busy like cooking for yourself and like keeping yourself fed and keeping yourself warm and checking cameras, downloading cards, backing up all the data. You're doing so much of that to keep the camp life going and keep the cameras running that there were only a couple hours every day of downtime. And honestly, like right now, I wish I could just be back out there and like have some rest and relaxation. But um, yeah, it was, it was something where it wasn't, from my perspective, it wasn't that hard to, to keep focused on, on the work. Yeah, and we need we need to pass the mic around just for the uh, the video stream. Yeah, since this is Google, I'll, I'll ask a technical question. Yeah. So um, I, I'm actually pretty interested in the rig you used for for shooting these long exposures because uh, I know one of the first things I thought looking at this with, when you had this device was uh, why you didn't get some cooperation from the vendor in terms of writing like custom firmware for the camera because I know that's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and my second question is just more general: uh, were there sort of like you, could you comment a little bit about sort of the special challenges of operating like an SLR in the middle of minus 40 degree Fahrenheit yeah, temperature? Yeah. Because uh, that can't be like, you know, walking down the street. No, it's be. very, very different. Um, so Nikon sponsored the project and they gave us 25 Nikon D200s, which was one of their leading uh, cameras at the time, uh, their leading DSLR for, for what we could, you know, use it in, in mass. Um, the timers that were available from Nikon were timers that uh, kept the camera running 24-7. Um, so the power drain was very, very high. And we couldn't, uh, we couldn't afford to use those timers because the battery supply, we couldn't bring enough batteries out there to keep that alive. Um, I, James talked with Nikon for sure, but their team wasn't available to be designing the hardware for us. Um, so James had worked with the guy privately to build the original uh, intervalometer to, to do that. Um, there, Nikon is a bit more restrictive. I believe the Canon cameras are a lot more open in terms of uh, fiddling with the firmware. Um, but I don't know if, uh, if it's as open for the Nikon system. So that's about I can, all I can speak to on that. Oh wait, sorry. Was there another question there oh, with the, the long, the long exposures? A, I was looking for fun anecdotes about like bad oh, things shooting, that happen to cameras. Yeah. Like, um, well, the, the worst thing that would happen is uh, there was one time where we were shooting on the beach, and James had uh, his camera in a waterproof housing, and he got so frustrated with the the bulk of the waterproof housing and not being able to operate it that he took it out of the bag. He kept shooting. Then a rogue wave came and splashed the camera, fried the camera. Um, so he was a little upset that day. Um, <laughs> just like you know, wasting an $8,000 camera. Um, but uh, the, the biggest difficulty is that they're not designed to be used with layers and layers of gloves. Like that's honestly the biggest complication for the, the still photo cameras and the video cameras. Because you've got like a, a Sony EX-1 with these little switches that you flick with your fingernail typically, and these tiny little buttons that you, like, you need your pinky to press. And when you have a, a mid-weight glove, then a heavy glove, and then a huge mitten on top of it, <laughs> being able to press any of those things with accuracy is impossible. Um, the, cam the Sony cameras uh, worked amazingly well in the cold. They held up. Uh, the batteries held up. Uh, you keep the batteries warm inside your jacket pocket. Um, you swap them out kind of regularly, and that keeps the, the batteries going as long as possible. Um, but I, I kept a little pen in my coat or available, and I'd use the pen in my mitten to like poke at different <laughs> buttons and mess with little switches. And that was really a simple device like that became like so much easier to operate. 
um, then having to take off your mitten, then you have to fold it in half so snow doesn't get inside, and you put it in between your legs or under your arm so that snow doesn't get inside your glove and you don't drop it or lose it. And now you've got still two layers of gloves on and it's still too bulky to really operate everything. Um, James would often take his gloves off because he got so frustrated, um, but he did get frost nip a number of times on his fingertips. Yeah. 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 Last question. Uh, curious about this one big glacier where you had to move the camera because mm -hmm. it's receding. Mm -hmm. um, just how many years are left on that glacier? Uh, how many years are left on the glacier? It's a it's an interesting question. It's a tough one for me to answer specifically. Um, the uh, glacier has gone through incredible retreat. In my lifetime, I think it's retreated something like 13 miles, 12 to 14 miles in that range. Um, it is expected to continue to retreat, but based on the topography of the land underneath, I, th I believe that there are some like natural points where it will no longer be ocean terminating, and it'll basically uh, kind of, I'm not fully aware of, of the long-term projections on that one. The glacier is called the Columbia Glacier. Um, our scientist, uh, Tad Pfeffer, has done a bunch of papers on that. Um, the best I can advise is to look up Tad Pfeffer and the Columbia Glacier to see future predictions on that. Yeah, because I'm not a glaciologist. Yeah. Uh, very quickly. Uh, so I had to ask, too. I noticed you had some lead-acid batteries and power solar panels. Don't those freeze up? Do they work at all? Um, the lead-acid batteries uh, were out there. They performed poorly, but they were, in some cases, the only, oppor like the only option we had available. Um, there were times where y we, we couldn't, I don't know if it can be done, if Google can do this, but we couldn't be shipping batteries to Greenland. We have to buy batteries locally in Iceland and in Greenland, so you're kind of stuck with whatever you can get locally. Um, there were times where we had lead-acid batteries in hiking packs, and Adam was skiing around with a lead-acid battery on his back. Um, he was the best skier of the group, um, <laughs> which is why he was doing that. Um, I, I didn't want to volunteer for that position, but uh, yeah, they didn't perform very well. James really tried to work them out of the system. Uh, we had one battery that exploded in a camera box um, in Alaska. We just opened it, and there's like smoke inside the whole. Lot. I mean, it you know settled at that point, but there was just the dust uh, lining the inside of the Pelican case. Um, but yeah, it was really difficult to get the right tools in those places. What were you? The you said you cycled them out. What were you using instead? Uh, there are other batteries. I, I don't know the battery technology explicitly, but we ended up using um, smaller, uh, effectively now we just use like motorcycle batteries. Um, and I don't know what ki kind of technology uh, behind the batteries, but the solar panels are smaller, the batteries are smaller, and they, uh, they're at the point now where they can last for a long period of time because of the way the timer is designed, because they can hibernate for so long. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. thanks. I want to thank you for yeah, your thank time you. today. Yeah. Uh, Jeff's going to be available if you want to informally chat with him, but we need to uh, close the talk. And thank you so much. Yeah, thank time. you guys very much. <laughs>